Um, is the screen, have you got? Yes, um, it's showing, uh, but it's not full there. It's full screen. Yep, full screen? Yes. Perfectly. Yep. Perfect. No problem. I, I tried to run it, but if I played it before I shared the screen, Zoom was having a bit of an issue. So um, we've got it now. Hey, Trish, can you keep your eye out for if I miss anyone that's coming in? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. Let me just Perfect. change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, from time to time, I'm going to have a sip of water. Um, but let's get into it. So firstly, thank you so much for joining the program. So what we're going to do today is, so this program came out of um, the book I wrote on narcissism, Rise Above Narcissism. Um, and, you know, it's it, it wasn't to repeat the book, but it was to give another visual and academic aspect to different parts of narcissism that we sort of can't get anywhere else and to give you a much deeper understanding of it, its effects of it, um, the way narcissists think, the things you will have um, gone through and experienced and try and put some light on it. So that's what we're going to go through today. So let's start with the basics. Narcissism. Um, when we talk about narcissism, most of us know that it's a personality disorder or they, you know the reference narcissistic personality disorder or the acronym NPD. So this is what it's called. But what I want to do is dig into what does that actually mean, right? When you string those three words together, what does it mean? How does it impact us? And what are those sorts of things? So when we look at personality, <clears throat> we've got to understand first that character resides at the center core of your consciousness, right? So it's the character within you that is going to get reflected in action that really is personality. So it's the type of thing where, you know, if you are a integral, truthful, compassionate, loyal, loving type of person, your personality will directly reflect that in the way you think, feel and behave. If you're character lacks in those areas and you are manipulative, coercive, abusive, untrustworthy, you know, untruthful, your personality will reflect that, right, in the way you think, feel and behave. So if you could imagine right there and then, right, we drew a line in the sand and we said there are two different personality types of people and we're just going to narrow it down to that. One is truthful, one is not truthful. You can imagine with everything that processes through their mind, the outcome is going to be completely different to that of which you operate as a truthful person. One of the questions when we've been in a narcissistic relationship is, you know, um, how can they do that? Right? The reason that you're asking how can they do that is because your filter system, right, for argument's sake, your filter system, right, pair of glasses, I'm now seeing the world differently, right? Now you're not blurry. Now you are, <laughs> right? But the reality is, you know, we do this. I now see things differently. So that's their filter system. So when they filter something through, it's processing through a, an area where all the bits that connect to truth aren't there. Where you're trying to understand it from a process of all the bits of information does lead to truth. And because they don't lead to truth and you do, you're trying to understand it from, you know, but this and they're going, no, they don't see it that way. <laughs> And this is the fundamental difference. So personality, it, 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 we've got to understand, it refers to the individual differences in characteristics, patterns of thinking, feeling, and behavior. Now, a disorder of personality, right, is a mental disorder in which you have a rigid and unhealthy pat pattern of thinking, functioning, and behaving. Now, you will have experienced that. But the key word there is to understand that we're talking about a mental disorder. Personality disorder is a type of mental 
disorder. A mental disorder is something different again. So a mental dis disorder is a clinically significant disturbance in the way in which they think from a cognition point of view, an emotional regulation point of view, and a behavioural point of view. And this is what we're dealing with when we talk about narcissism. So when we think narcissism, we need to think of a mental disorder. So how does someone with a mental disorder behave that way? See how it kind of makes more sense than how did Johnny behave that way? Right? We all of a sudden, once we realize they've got a mental disorder, now it may not have been diagnosed. I understand that. But just because it's di diagnosed doesn't mean it's not so. I've never been diagnosed with blue eyes, but I haven't. It's just a fact, right? <laughs> I like it or don't like it. So the other thing we need to look at is narcissism sits on a spectrum. I'm not going to go through all the detail. You can read the information there. But the reality is when we talk narcissism, and this is where a lot of the confusion comes in, we're looking at the fact that it sits on a scale and it sits on a scale from self-loathing all the way to self-idolization. Both really come from insecurity. They're just displayed in two different ways. How am I going to deal with my insecurity? Am I going to play on the back foot or am I going to play on the front foot? Right? The, this is really how it's looking. But then you have a look in the middle, and this is the confusing component, where you go right smack bang in the middle is a healthy level of narcissism. So I don't agree with the term, however the term is the term, um, and, and the way in which people look at it, but I understand it. You go a healthy level of narcissism is going to sit at that level of self-trust, self-respect, self-worth, and self-love. So it's going to be the type of thing where they may they may have all these massive ambitions. So if you look at a lot of entrepreneurs, high-level CEOs, business leaders, those sorts of things, they quite often have narcissistic personality traits, but at a very healthy level. So in other words, they use all of those skill sets because they're in a really good place to empower, to motivate, to inspire, to lead for positive change, for positive shift, to improve versus using as a weapon because it comes from insecurity. So if you understand that spectrum, um, it makes a lot more sense. And can can you have someone that, that sits on the self-loathing -loath side but also displays behaviour from a self-idolisation position? Yeah, absolutely. They can cross over all these realms. It's not a hard and fast rule. So sometimes you have, yeah, they kind of do this, but they kind of do that. And that throws you off the track, off the scent. But the reality is, no, that, that absolutely, um, it's all part of it. And if any point in time, if I'm going too fast, if I say something you're not sure of, um, please, because particularly with such a small group, no problem, you know, pop your hand up, ask this question and everything's good. <clears throat> So what I've done here is I have rewritten the definition of narcissism. Um, I believe that the definition of narcissism that you find um, in, in and on um, the internet, Google, those sorts of things, really gives you a watered down version of what you will have experienced, right? You read the, the, the Google version and it's kind of like, listen, you know, these people can be, you know, and you're like, yep, that's not what I lived, where this is what I believe it is. You know, it's the ability to lift you up so high. That's the love bombing, to chop you down so low, the gaslighting, so that they can manipulate you to the point where you're going to accept accountability and responsibility for their evil. And, you know, it comes out in all shapes and sizes. Then... The whole point of gaslighting is to break you down to the point where you perceive that their, their, their evil as goodness, appreciate it as greatness, and even be grateful to receive it, all while they coerce you, right? To be thankful they tolerate you and humbled that they chose you. <laughs> That's the art of narcissism. So 
we look at it and we go, once we understand that, um, we will work. Once we understand that, we know that, th I mean, and this is why I often say, you know, when you're a narcissist, what should I do? I'm like, run, run, get the hell out of there, right? Because the, the reality is the only thing that happens with a narcissist in 99.999% of the time is they get worse and worse and worse and worse, right? So we understand this. We understand this different definition. And all of a sudden, the intent here is that you are heard and that you go, yeah, that's much more about my experience. And it gives you a great understanding of going, why do they do it? And you're, here's the reason why, right? They've got to break you down at that level. And we're going to dig deeper into it. Where's my mouse? There we go. So these are, and you may have Googled this before when researching narcissism, these are the nine narcissistic personality traits that a psychiatrist is going to be looking for in order to do the diagnosis, right? You look at these type of personality traits and it's like, yep, this is what I'm talking about, a Google answer. You look at it and go, yep, that's kind of like they lack empathy, lack empathy it's like i don't know about your experiences but like empathy they drove me to hell and back and then laughed while doing at it you go it wasn't lacking empathy right it was psychopathic so it doesn't kind of fit but here's the confusing part when we read these nine points it's very easy when you've been gaslit when you're when you've doubted your own self and when you've been attacked and accused of being the narcissist to read this and go oh my gosh i do some of these things and it's like yes every single human does do some of these things <laughs> it's part of being human right so there's balance in it but the reality is in order to be diagnosed as a narcissist you would have to have strong areas of five of these i look at it and go, I don't give a toss about the diagnosis. If you're living with someone with two of these things that they are driving home, manipulating, coercing, abusing, gaslighting, love bombing, breaking you down, it's too, too many. Don't rely on the diagnosis is my point, right? Because the reality is your partner really putting their hand up and saying, listen, you could be right. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to go and get checked. They're not doing that. So we, we don't worry about it. But but here's, here's just part of the knowledge that we need to know when we've suffered from narcissism. So now this is the imagery that I was talking about that I wanted to share with you to start processing the way a narcissist mind thinks. Because when you've suffered from narcissism and you've suffered from the behavioural patterns of narcissism, Part of the reason why you break yourself down, why you lose self-worth, why you detach from your own identity, why you feel worthless and lost and broken has a lot to do with this because we're looking at it through our perspective, but it's not our perspective that we need to look at it through. So let's look at a day-to-day -day event. And there is a reason that I called it a day-to-day -day life event. So right up the very top there, day-to-day -day life event. The reason that I say day-to-day -day life event is because it could be anything. You, you, you potentially could have put some toast on wrong. You, you, you could have got dressed incorrectly. Right? We have to remember with a narcissist, anything that you say and do will be used against you. Everything that you don't say can and will be used against you. Everything you think can and will be used again. Anything that you don't think, anything that they thought that you thought. In other words, there's no reality. It could be anything. So a day-to-day -day life event. A day-to-day -day life event happens. And what happens is it goes through, I've picked five of the nine personality traits, right? And it's going to get grabbed by one, two, three, or all of these personality traits as it goes through in an instance in an absolute instance. And they're going to separate a few things. To one side is the recycle bin. 
And that's reality and truth. Because a narcissist doesn't need reality and truth. So they throw it in the bin. Right? Their mind doesn't process it as, remember, mental disorder. The way in which they process it's not processed as their reality or their truth. And therefore, what comes out the other side is the narcissistic perspective. In other words, the story they tell themselves. Now, remember at this point in time, this image is showing you something here saying nothing's been said. There's no look, no reaction, nothing at this point. It's just an instance. And this is what's happened. And we, we, we look into the narcissistic perspective. So to look into the narcissistic perspective, we've got to understand a few additional things. So we have a look at reality and truth, because at the end of the day, reality gives rise to truth, right? So we look at the definition. Reality is both objective and subjective. Objective is, is what's measurable, observable right? Real, tangible, right? That, that's a reality, right? The other is what is subjective. In other words, your perception and your perspective. And we combine the two to navigate life. Well, the narcissistic reality is the rewritten version of history that serves them, their desired outcomes, and how they want you to think, feel, and act. So in other words, what we're talking about here is their reality is delusion. Yet how many of us have, well, let's face it, had real attempts at trying to convince our narcissist of true reality? And they're not having a bar of it because it doesn't suit Right. So then we look at truth. The truth is the body of real things, events and facts. It's a combination of both objective and subjective reality. Well, again, a narcissist, a narcissist doesn't work in it. It's about how they feel at that time. What they want the outcome to be and how they want you to think, feel and act. So again, it's delusion. So the reality is we're dealing with someone that is deluded. And that is their perspective. So their perspective comes from the insecurity of whether it's self-loathing or self-admiration you know, admiration or idolization. So we're dealing with their defense mechanism. And their defense mechanism processes in a way where their perspective says all roads lead to their greatness, correctness, and blamelessness. And if it doesn't lead there, this is why they get on the attack because they see it as an attempt to assassinate the fame and destroy them. So you know when you're in an argument with a narcissist and it's like, I'm not attacking you, I'm simply just trying to explain, right? Lizzie, I've got to tell you, your facial expressions, I'm like, you say nothing and I'm like, oh, you just nailed it. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. I'm trying to like not be like, wow. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, but you look at it and you go, so it's the narcissistic perspective that we're dealing with through the filtration system of their personality traits combined with their mental disorder, right? And that's what we're dealing with. So then we have a look at a few other parts and we'll go into this into the next, in the next level of um, the, the imagery but it's understanding what empathy is. Empathy is the ability to understand another person's thoughts and feelings in a situation from their point of view rather than your own. So how many of us have tried to use empathy as a way of communicating with a narcissist, right? Yeah, the narcissist doesn't have empathy. And you're saying, I need you to see it from my perspective. And they're going, if I look at it through your eyes, man, that would make me look shit and no deal. <laughs> what you want me to accept that I'm uh -uh, not having any part of that. I tell you what's more comfortable. You're a bitch. <laughs> You're wrong. It's your fault. It's <laughs> much easier to deal with than looking in the mirror. Yep. And that's the reality.
So let's look at this image a bit further. So we have a day-to-day -day life event. It filters through their person, their narcissistic personality traits. They eliminate reality and truth. They shift through their perspective. Remember, at this stage, nothing has happened. Nothing has been said. It then goes through the second process where they need to get rid of a few more things. That's you, your needs, your wants, and your desires. Right? Which means the removal of empathy and humanity. So we're now dealing with a person in a particular situation that has removed reality and truth, empathy and humanity. They're now in a position where they can respond. They pick up their needs, their wants, their desires, and they, they respond. How do they respond? This is the way I say to look at it. They respond with narcissism. So what is narcissism because narcissism is just not narcissism we look at it we go there's a heading narcissism hmm, what is that and you go this is what it is that is a representation and only a brief representation of narcissism this is what you're dealing with. So when you say that one simple heading, narcissist, narcissism, NPD, this is what we're talking about. And here's the kicker. Every single one of these points on the screen right now, we could do an entire hour session on, right? So when people say, well, why didn't you just leave? It's like, because you don't understand. You just don't get it. And that's okay. And we'll pick back up on that. It's grooming, manipulation, coercion, projection, ghosting, isolation, soul, love bombing. Try and deal with just those, whatever it is, nine points there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just those ones. But no, and here's the kicker. When does it happen? Very first thing in the morning. You may not even have got out of bed. Could be last thing at night. Could be just before sex. Could be during sex. Could be after sex. Could be at dinner. Could be with a friend. Here's one for you. Two minutes before we arrive at your family's function or at a party or at a social event. Not to mention the hours leading up to it, but a couple of bombs right now. So when you walk in and people are like, huh, looks like someone shit in your mouth. It's like someone did. This bloke that's going to pump you full of air all night. Right? Or woman. And that's the reality. So when we talk about narcissism, we need to understand it's like, oh, so multi-layered and here's the kicker we look you know how did i fall for it in other words narcissism has something to do with intellect your intellect it's like no it's got nothing to do with it i can promise you right now if you grab that list and talk to nearly any trained therapist psychologist and said i want you in detail to talk to me about each and every single point and what it they're going to go, dude, hang on, let me do some homework before I'll come back to you. <laughs> and you're like, you've got to deal with this at any point in time, when you're at your weakest, when you've been abused the most, when your cortisol levels are high, your prefrontal cortex is turned off, your limbic system is fired up, you're all reactional. This is what you've been dealing with. And there's all different types of narcissism. And I'm not going to read all the, the boxes for you. Um, I'm sure you didn't come here to be read to. But the reality is these are just some of the narcissistic types. Covert, overt, sexual, right? Malignant, antagonistic, communal. They all have their different points. The ones we typically deal with as covert, overt. Um, I, I typically find nearly every narcissistic relationship is sort of laden with kind of all of them, there's just one they kind of lean on. And I think sexual narcissism is just part of narcissism. It kind of fits in every single one. 
particularly when it's a male narcissist, because the tool they use, you know, at all different levels. Um, and it's absolutely horrific when you think, you know, manipulating people at one level is a level of disgust that's hard to grapple. You know, talking about manipulating people at a level of, you know, an intimate level, you know, at that, you, you're just going, it defies um, everything that we comprehend, but that's what they are and that's what they do and why we have to understand it is a mental disorder. We have to understand it was not you. We have to understand that, no, you weren't stupid because you ended up with a narcissist. We're dealing with so many moving parts. And, and, and again, these are just some of them, but I kind of try and just tip it to, to, to the six most common um, that we deal with. And then we have one of their favorite tools, which is triangulation. Right? Narcissistic triangulation is one of the main weapons of a narcissist. And triangulation starts often while you are still being love bombed. While it's in the early stages, triangulation often starts, but you weren't aware of it. In the later stages, you see it kind of everywhere. In the early stages, you quite often don't because things are amazing. And you will go to a family function and those sorts of things. And, you know, you'll see him over there talking to you, your mom or your dad or your brother or your best friend. And, you know, and he's really pumping you, right? She's amazing. She's beautiful. She's wonderful. I can't believe it. Ba ba ba. And they're going, what an incredible human being. And then he just lays a little bit of doubt in their mind. You know, I just can't believe she can't see it. What? She's so confident. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I first met her, I thought the same thing. But like behind closed doors, my gosh, she's grappling with a couple of things. But um, I've been talking to her, been helping her. You know, I'm really pumping her tires up. Hey, beautiful. Hey. You know. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, oh, should I talk to her? Oh, please. Please don't talk to her because um, she made me promise that I wouldn't say anything when we came here. Right? And the best friend's going, what? She tells me everything. <laughs> right? <laughs> or it's the dad or it's the brother. But don't worry. Oh, if I get anything, I'll let you know. It's all good. And off he goes, gets in the car. And it's way up, way up, way up. <laughs> this is the type of thing that's happening. You'll know that later stages of it where they're using children right when they discard you and they're using other partners and other women and other whatever it might be so they're constantly using you look at the term flying monkeys for those that don't know flying monkey is just they're using other people to to, to assassinate you right the wizard of oz the flying monkeys come along to do the dirty work that's what we're talking about they recruit and they constantly recruit so it's one of those things you go Oh, but we go out in public and like butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. And it's like, you see, this is all part of it, right? It's all part of it. It's the big game. And you go, wow, there's so many moving parts. They must be so intelligent. I'm like, no, right? I deal with, you know, people that have suffered from narcissism from high level CEO executives all the way through to the dumbest ass, dumb asses, right? That can't string a sentence together yet they have something in common and it's called narcissism and they all learn the same sort of skills. And this is what it's about. So the process they go through is this here. And that process is they start with attraction. Got to bring you in, got to attract you, all right? Then we move into the honeymoon stage. We move into the covert stage, the gaslighting stage, the triangulation stage, the intimidation stage, and then you can see what it is at the end. But as we go through here, the attraction stage, to love bomb you, to allure you, right? And I'm going to explain what love bombing is in a minute, but effectively love bombing is the abuse of love. It's to mimic the words, actions, and behaviors of love so wonderful in the beginning to mimic 
the words, actions, and behaviors of love. They've learned to mimic it because that's how they display it. They don't love the way we love. And therefore, they've learned the behavioral patterns, right? And, and if we, let's not insult them too much, but monkey see, monkey do, right? That's what they've learned. And then they move into the honey, uh, to, you know, the honeymoon stage. So it's to love bomb you where we, they want to disarm and addict you. So how do they do that? First, bring you in to the trap. The trap hasn't gone off yet. Then we need to disarm you. We've got to make you relax, right? We've got to make you feel comfortable. How do they do that? Well, the fastest way to, to get someone to trust you isn't to demand trust. It's to give trust. Because as soon as they share with you a story of woe, your empathy kicks up. You reciprocate. You share and you, and you help and you trust. And when you trust is a little bit different to when they mimic the words, actions and behaviors of love. So it's the start of the addiction stage. They move into the covert stage, which is where pass passive aggression comes in. So it's the early stages of grooming. It's all stages of grooming, but this is where grooming really amps up. So passive aggression. What is passive aggression? It's indirect aggression, right? Are you really wearing that when we... Yep, no. no. What, don't you like it? No, I love it. I love it. I just haven't, you know... I didn't, yeah, no, it's, no, it's nice. And you're kind of like, what? Well, they see someone, your identical twin, right, that's got your body shape or the thing that you're uncomfortable with or the thing that you just purchased or the, the show that you like watching. What dickhead would like that show? Or, ugh. And you're kind of like, but I, I like, I, I've got a dress like that. Or I, I, well, what do you think? It, and now you're being silly. No, 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 that's got nothing to do with you. Gaslight, breaking you down, it's coming in towards passive aggression because what I'm trying to do is sow the seed of doubt. And I want to test the waters. How are you responding? Because I can't come in with, my, with the A game of narcissism yet. We've just got to do it. Where at the moment, we just need to tickle the cortisol levels. What does the cortisol level need once you've got that seed of doubt to be relieved? A little bit of love bombing right because that then releases oh releases that dopamine but they're a bit cheeky because there's something attached to the dopamine when it's in relationship see a dopamine is addictive right where's the connection love bombing love oxytocin furthers a bond hence why we end up trauma bonded because it's addictive. And then they gaslight you. The point of gaslighting is to disorientate you, to separate you, to delaminate de you from self, to, to no longer know your true north. So if you no longer know that true, no longer trust self, well, what have you got? Or them, of course. That's right, you've got the answers. I'll come to you. Yep, no, you, I mean, I didn't think I thought that, but... No, you're right. I, I guess I must have thought that thing that I would never think of. Yep. So we start telling stories to ourselves. Right? The triangulation stage is to do what but to isolate you. How are you going to stay in this torment if you've got those around you that are saying, this is bullshit? They're going to isolate you. Start causing rifts between you and those you love the most. Those where you rely on for your strength, for your direction, for when you fall to hold on to. You see, that will tell you if we what, what happens in the house stays in the house. That's only a rule for you. <laughs> you know, I didn't mean that's what we do. That's just what you do. <laughs> right? The intimidation stage, it's all about control. Ultimately, fear of loss. 
Fear of loss is one of the most powerful emotions, right? Everything's good until I say I'm going to take it away. Right? Anyone been at the party where there's a, you're having finger food and there's the one that comes through. There's just one left, right? <laughs> and you're kind of like, should I, shouldn't I? No, maybe I should leave that for someone else because we're empathetic, compassionate people. And then the plate walks off and you're like, what? <laughs> this is pull to it. <laughs> Right, it's a fear of loss. It's in in sales. It's a massive negotiation strategy. Right, what do sales do? There's only three left. Fear of loss. Right, in real estate, you want that house. How am I going to get you to put ten thousand dollars more into it than you really want to go? Listen, I've got someone else that is interested in the property. What? I've got another offer. What's the offer? Can't tell you, but let me just tell you, you're close, right? <laughs> but that's what it is. And then you've got the assassination stage, which is where they've got to the point where they've lost control and they want to regain control. But they can't regain control, so it's to destroy destroy your reputation, destroy your relationships, to destroy your financial position, to destroy whatever they can to bring misery, to have control, to effectively gain real estate in your mind when they're not around. I can't have you, no one else can have you type thing. So again, in my book, I rewrote the definition and here is my definition of love bombing. Love bombing is the abuse of love. It's a psychological drug used to mimic the words, action, but and, and behaviours of love to allure, disarm, disorientate, and ultimately to addict you to a manipulative and abusive person. So that's love bombing. If you actually see an MRI scan of a brain is that's just been love bombed and a brain scan that someone has just done a shot of cocaine, they're the same. They're almost identical. Hence why I say addiction. So we're just going to run through a bit of the process. I'm not going to read all the information. I'll read the key bits of information, but just to help you start recognizing how that pattern works in layers. So the idolization stage to allure and disarm, right? It's words, actions, behaviors to mimic love designed to inflate your ego. That's the love bombing stage to make you feel like a queen, to give you a sense of self-worth, right? Um, and all those good things. It's to maximize your strengths and virtues and to minimize your flaws and fear. In other words, to decide, like, trust me, I gotcha. Let go. I've gotcha. Right? They want you to feel all these amazing things, yet they become their own kryptonite. This is the bit we don't understand. Right? It must be, what did I do wrong? No, 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 no. They made you feel incredible. They can't handle you feeling incredible because all of a sudden they know they're not. They know they're putting on an act and they don't know it consciously, it's subconsciously. So they start feeling insecure as you start feeling more secure. The balance shifts. They have to break that down. So it comes in to affecting your belief systems, your perceptions, your perspectives and your perspectives. So your belief system is when I meet the right person, I'll be loved. When I meet the right person, there's got to be one out there for me. And when I meet the one, I'll be loved. And I'll know I'm loved when they show me they love me. Right? And the perspective is going to be that this is going to be so good, to, so you know, too good to be true. I'm so lucky. It's amazing. And I can't believe this is happening for me. And I want more. I'm in. And that's the cycle at this stage, early stages of grooming. Right? If I don't create a desire, how can I make it sticky? So we've got to understand what grooming is. 
Grooming is to make you ready for use and service. It's to fight for love and affirmation. It's to repeat behaviours that get acknowledged as good and to avoid behaviours that cause confrontation. And that's what they do. It's to, make, to, to push you into a point where you submit, right? Then to use denial to avoid reality, right? And that these behaviours are actually an act of love. So it's that the, the psychology switch. And here's the kicker. Narcissism, the art of a good narcissist, right, is when you hear it's been years, it's to enable you to withstand abuse. So many people that have been in narcissistic relationships, you know, one is what is one of their key virtues? Resilience. That smirk came out again. <laughs> She's like, fuck you. <laughs> the devaluation stage to disorientate you. It's a protective mechanism used to stabilize their self-esteem and protect them from feeling envy, the fear of loss and dependency. They seek further manipulative control over you. They will give less, take more and gaslight you, break you down. This is the start of the addiction. So again, how do you get left feeling, right? You're starting to feel, whoa, 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 what's going on here, right? Disorientation there. And what are they feeling, right? They're starting to move into it and then they get like a thirst, like there's blood in the water. And then the, the belief system starts shifting. I'll be loved if I give everything. The other belief system's shifting now. Right? When I meet the right person, I'll be loved. Now it's I'll be loved if I give everything. Right? Oops. Right? Your perception is if I'm abused and not loved, if it's not reciprocated, maybe I give more, expect less, they'll change. If they don't, it must be me. Right? And if it's me, that's my worth. And I'm feeling broken. And around we go. Gaslighting. Again, this is in my book. This is my definition of gaslighting. This isn't what you find on Google. Gaslighting is an offensive strategy because this is what we're moving into now. It's an offensive strategy to break your trust and reliance. And they do this intentionally and systematically. But they want to break your trust and reliance on your sanity, your perception of reality, and your memories. And they do this to gain psychological dominance over you and emotional and intellectual dependence of you. That is the true meaning of gaslighting. You will come back for more because you no longer trust you. And here's the kicker. What is the foundation of self-worth? The foundation of self-worth is self-trust. Because if you don't trust you, you will lose respect in you. If you don't trust and lose respect in you, you will see less value, which is your worth. It will delaminate you from self and you will stop loving you. You are no longer in, or even if you weren't before, you are definitely not now in relationship with you. And we know the effects of gaslighting. The default position is to accept blame and responsibility. In other words, we take accountability and responsibility for their evil. What was that first definition of narcissism? That's what they do. We become, we, we develop that feeling of need to apologize. We have self-doubt. We're constantly in that, that fight, flight, freeze mode. We overthink everything. We lose worth and identity. And worse. And then these are just, you know, this is kind of a normal type of thing that you're going to hear, right? There's going to be the attack, right? You're a psycho. There is always so much drama with you. Seriously, you have issues. You are so wrong. Let me correct you. It's your fault. I didn't say that at all in denial. You're just imagining it, gaslighting. 
right? What you're failing to understand. Again, break yourself down, listen to me. You can't trust you. Let me explain it to you, right? I'm not arrogant. I'm just a whole lot better than you. Trust me. I just know, right? They're putting stature in place. Without me, you would be nothing. The fear of loss. If I lose you, I'm now cemented in here. You are so lucky I put up with you. We're shifting your perspective. We're throwing that seed in there. So oh, I can't, I've, got, I've got to stay. What would, I mean, he's right. What would I, and they're going to point out the areas that you feel vulnerable in. But of course, they tell you this because they love you. Help me help you. It's putrid. It's absolutely putrid. And they go into the discarding stage. The protective mechanism, again, comes from insecurity. So I keep starting with this a protective mechanism because it is. And it's used by a narcissist when they have broken you to the point where you can no longer, you, where they can no longer use you for their gain. We often talk about narcissism and you as their fuel source. What are you the fuel source of, right? Their own ego, their insecurity, because they don't deal in reality and truth. And therefore all the bull crap has them believing their own lies. And this is how they do it, right? It's how they leave you feeling. And what do they feel? I, I, I didn't feel it right to explain that because depending on where you are in the cycle, I think it can be way too painful. And we've gone pretty deep as it is. But what I can say is they don't have empathy and they are completely detached from reality and truth. And therefore, the reality, what do they feel? Justified. They feel completely justified in all of their wrongdoing. And you already know the blame sits with you. And this is where they sit. So your belief system at the end ends up that I'm not lovable and I'm nothing without them and that you're broken and worthless and that you can't move on. Uh, how many people, how many, how many women do you hear or how many people do you hear, both women and men say the same thing, that have come out of abusive relationships? Forget narcissism, but abusive. And narcissism is one form of abuse. And they go, you know, I'll never be in relationship again. I'll never get married again. You may have said, fuck men, they're all shit. <laughs> <laughs> And what I'm learning is you're not that far from being wrong either. <laughs> but I like to think there's a couple of goodies out there. But the reality is you think of that. That's what they want you to think. Of course they do. They don't want you to actually deal with reality. Because what is the reality? And here's a hard truth because we've got women in this room right now. I have suffered from narcissism. I have been the one abused. And here I have women in the room. And am I to think that you are all evil and are not possible of loving me the way I deserve to be loved? That's, it just wouldn't be right because it doesn't sit with you in this room. And so it sits on the other side. There are good men out there. I'm not saying they're not dumb. They need educating. But there's good men out there. <laughs> I was actually running a men's um, coaching session um, because it's sort of spread a little bit with a few um, key guys that are quite influential and... They're kind of like, wow, because they didn't know how to navigate today's society and to be a man in today's society and what that looks like and have it, how to navigate that space. Um, and it's kind of growing a little bit. Um, and it's interesting when you, when you hear the way they interpret what's going on in a situation or a woman's mind or the way in which she's communicating. 
and how they think their responses are going to be received by a woman. <laughs> and it's kind of like, I now talk to him and I'm like, yeah, I get it. Yep, I could see that. <laughs> it's not what they might get. <laughs> so it's an interesting, it's an interesting insight. But as a, as, a, as, as a consequence of suffering from abuse, right? Narcissism. We end up trauma bonded, right? This is my explanation of a trauma bond so we understand it at a, at a different point. And to simplify it, I think simplifying complexity is the best way to deal with it, right? We can get all clever, but I'm not an academic, so it's nice to keep it simple. <laughs> and I break it down to these three areas, love bombing, abuse, and devaluation. Love bombing, abuse, and devaluation, and that's the way it goes. So you've got to remember this in tiny, tiny little increments, right? Because how does narcissism work? right? It wasn't day one where the worst of the worst came. It was subtle, right? So my explanation of this is if you could imagine that <laughs> I grabbed the toilet roll, right? And I said, look at the toilet roll, study it. And then what I want you to do is carefully tear off one square. And I want you to put that one square down on the table neatly get the toilet roll and have a look at it can you see any difference between now and when you started and the reality is of course you can't next day pick it up have a look at it tear one square off it put it down make it neat look at the toilet roll do you see any difference do it again do it again do it again you will never ever ever see the difference because one square is too small amount for you to detect by looking at it. But then one day you were left looking at this cardboard roll <laughs> and you went, I am sure there was paper on this at one stage, <laughs> right? That's how it happens. And you look down at the table and there's 500 stacks of squares of, and you go, that's how it happens. You don't see it happening. It's kind of like weight loss. You don't just see it, but it happens. Or the alternative, weight gain. You don't see it, but it happens. So love bombing. We understand love bombing and we're going to come back to it and leave it as the last point. So you, you're love bombed, you're lured, you've got the desire, you've given your trust um, into the relationship, you've committed, you're loyal, and they abuse you. The abuse triggers your fear response, which is your fight, flight, freeze mode. Your body dumps adrenaline and cortisol into your blood system, right? Your prefrontal cortex, which is the strategic part of the brain, shuts off. Your limbic system fires up, which is reactional, right? And you freeze. You're in a relationship and you freeze into that relationship. Yet the pain is so bad when they devalue to the point where you have to now justify it, work it out, process it. So what you do is you focus on their positives. You'll tell your friends their positives. You'll make excuses for them. And you'll start breaking yourself down. It's all part of trying to deal with that level of pain and anguish and trauma. And what do you seek to find relief in this pain? Their love. But it's not love. It's love bombing. Because abuse is not lo loving. Manipulation is not loving. Coerce is not loving. Lies is not loving. Calling you horrible names is not loving. And therefore, there's, it's not love. So when it comes through and they all of a sudden throw you a, throw you a bone, love bombing, you need the positive reinforcement, you get it, and what does it do? It releases dopamine. Dopamine's addictive, right? We all know dopamine's the addiction drug. Add dopamine with a bit of oxytocin and you ain't going anywhere because that strengthens the bond. So they can then give you some more abuse to fire up your limbic system, to release adrenaline and cortisol, to increase your heart rate, your blood pressure, to decrease your immune system, to put you in a place where you are suffering so much pain, you can't, don't feel like you can go on. So you start making excuses for them. You break it down. You tell others that, no, 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 it's not that bad. No, he does do some good things. 
You start creating stories to make it work. You break yourself down. You try more. You seek that attention. You finally get it, but it's less than the last time. But that's okay. You see, an alcoholic, to start with, needs five, six drinks before he can go to seven, eight, nine, ten. Then he needs four or five drinks before he goes to seven, eight, nine, ten. Then he doesn't even need to see a bottle. You certainly wouldn't sit him in the pub, but that's what you are, sitting in the relationship. Even when it's after the relationship, you're sitting in the relationship psychologically. Why? Because you're thinking about them. You might be thinking about all the bad things, but you're thinking about them. And what's the one thing that you can't remove? The reality, right? You're looking at it and you're going, you know, I still have that desire. Addiction. Smoking doesn't make sense. It has to be one of the dumbest things that man does. Yet we do it. I used to be a smoker. And we know it's killing ourselves. So why do we do it? It's got nothing to do with intellect. It's not like you don't know. It's because we're addicted. It's simple as that. It's addiction. Addiction isn't just a case of, oh, yeah, no, you're right. I just stop. Yeah, no, you're right. No, it's chemical reactions in the body. It's a dependency of. It's habitual. What is the habit to think of, to focus? And this is what happens. So before I go into the next step, do we have people that want to go into parallel parenting and co-parenting? If it's not relative to this particular group, there's no point going into it in detail. But if you do, you do? Yep, beautiful. All right. So one of the things with narcissism is to recognize that there's no such thing as co-parenting. The way in which you've got to think of co-parenting is a relay race, right? In other words, we've got we've all got the same intention. You and the, 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 the father, sperm, donor, whatever you want to call them, um, of the child. <laughs> See, this is why this is why I can't go and get my psychology license, even though I've done all the schooling, is because I'd very quickly get debarred or something. <laughs> Those are the truth bombs. Um, but the reality is um, you look at it and you go, it's both of you putting the child first, wanting the best for the child, regardless of how much it might suck for you and I. And we're going to go in the right direction and we've got the same goal, right? And we keep the shit between you and I separate. And we focus on the child, co-parenting. So people that have been in narcissistic relationships you know, often talk about, you know, co-parenting and it's go, you've got to realize there's no such thing. So in other words, what we have to do is parallel parent, right? So it's accepting that narcissistic co-parenting is a myth. It's accept acceptance is the first step to any recovery. How do you recover from alcoholism? Accept. Hi, my name is Jamie Ryder. I'm an alcoholic. Okay, now I can start processing. Oh, no, 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 I don't have a problem. Okay, you're not quite ready yet. So we've got to accept that we're in that particular position. So it's to accept what is rather than focusing on what isn't. And this is this sounds simple, right? To accept what is rather than focusing on what isn't. And I guarantee you this, most of your focus on what isn't. I wish you could just do this and I wish you could just do that. And why? Why does it? Get the frustration. But you're thinking with your filter system. You're thinking with reality and truth. You're thinking with love, compassion, empathy, truthfulness, trustworthiness, humility, selflessness. They don't have that stuff. Wrong glasses. <laughs> they have the me, 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 filter. So it didn't work that way. So we've got to focus on what is, in other words, 
If I said to you right now, competition, whoever wins get 10 bucks. And all you've got to do to win the $10 is not think about purple elephants. My 10 bucks is pretty safe because our brains doesn't work about, okay, what am I not thinking about? I am not thinking about purple elephants. Bum, bum. Our brains don't operate that way. It doesn't work on that. We have to tell our brain what to do. The same thing, I talk to people about weight loss. Jamie, will you help me lose weight? 100%. The first thing we're gonna do is that's not gonna be our goal. Hmm? What do you mean? Well, like goal, let's not make goal. Gone, that's a really shitty goal. Because effectively what you're telling me is that you're overweight. Let's make over, that's a horrible thing. You want to shift weight? No worries. Let's fight. What? Okay, what can we do? We can we, we can concentrate on nutrition and exercise. Let's get those right. We can put, let's concentrate where our mind goes. Let's look at our, the, the consequence of doing those things is, well, I'll just happen. I'll just do as it's told. And I don't think I'm going to, it's not the way it works. So this is parallel parenting, right? It's to accept and treat every word of a narcissist as a lie. And people say to me, that's a bit harsh. And I go, no, it's not. Sounds a bit narcissistic, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's true, right? You have a look at it and you go, once you know with someone that doesn't speak the truth, don't rely on a single word that they say. Because whether it is the truth or not, you will never really know. So re don't rely on their word. Accept and know that every level of kindness or vulnerability is manipulation. So if all of a sudden it's kind of like things seem to be going the right direction, there's a reason. It's all part of the master plan and you know it's going to come crashing down on you. Right? Doesn't mean that you don't take advantage of it. Don't rely on it. Because we accept that they don't take a day off. We accept that they're not going to change. In fact, they're going to get worse. We create a strategic plan that's tight, that's enforceable and has consequences as much as we can. If we need legal intervention, we use it where we can, if we can. But we learn to speak our truth with peaceful confidence. In other words, to manage our boundaries because you're constantly coming in to contact with someone that is going to be permeating those boundaries. I hope you like the fact, see, I can't help myself. I'm not even going there. I'm trying not to use the word penetrate. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so um, yeah, learn to speak your truth with peaceful confidence, right? And never to get drawn into aggressive or passive aggressive discussions. Right to speak your truth with peaceful confidence is to learn to know your position, understand. Well, I'm not. What is my intent of even saying these words? Okay, um, I have to say X Y. Well, I'm going to say X Y. I'm. It just is. I'm not going to get drawn into the bullshit of an argument because I don't. I don't accept the word that they say is true. I'm not asking for an opinion. I'm certainly not asking for an opinion of me and of what you think of me. So I speak my truth in peaceful content. I don't yell. I don't scream. I don't, I don't try and use snide comments. And I'm not buying into anything that they're saying. Does this have something to do with our children? Yes or no? No, it doesn't. Okay, disregard. Yes, it does. Even if this, is this even right? And accept the fact that it's going to be a full-time job. It's relentless. Manage clear, tight boundaries. Choose your battles. Rise above their behaviours. Focus on your recovery. Focus on you. Focus on you. Focus on you. Never run them down. But educate your kids on character. You educate your kids on character. Start talking in character. Start praising your kids in character. I'm so proud of you for speaking your truth. Thank you so much for being humble. That was incredible. And talk to them about what that means and what humility is and those sorts of things in general conversation. So horses for courses, if we're talking to a three-year-old, we're going to be talking a little bit differently 
to that of a 13 year old, definitely a 13 year old boy. Educate your children on character, live by example. That's where they're going to learn. Be the picture of what you want them to learn and practice gratitude every day because that's going to alter your cortisol levels. So we talk about these belief systems before, and I just want to dig back down into where they're formed, right? Belief systems come from repetition or dramatic emotional impact. Repetition, things that happen over and over again, dramatic emotional impact is trauma, right? These form belief systems. Belief systems affect your perception. Your perception affects your perspective. Your perspective affects your prospective which circles bound around, enforces your belief systems and around and around we go. This is the merry-go, merry-go-round, right? So we have a look at it. Your belief systems, you know, the way you perceive meaning from the past. Your perception is your filter system, how you interpret things. Your perspective is your point of view. The story that you tell yourself and your perspective are how things are going to play out in the future. So we need to alter them. And to have self-worth, we need to alter them to understand we're cycling all the way back. I will be loved when I know I'll be loved when I truly love myself. That's what your belief system needs to alter to. I will be loved when I truly love myself. And I promise you this, you never have to worry about the outside world. When you're in good relationship with you, when you truly love you, when you know who you are, when you know the character that resides at the center core of your consciousness, everything else comes into your world differently. You're judging this based on a belief system that is something other than the truth. And when you alter that and step into this strength, your world changes. Your perception then becomes, when I truly love myself, they will love me for all. Look at the words in capital, all that I am. There are two sides to all of us, right? Now, you might find this incredibly hard to believe, but I, I've got some things that aren't good either that my wife has to grapple with. <laughs> i got plenty of things that my wife has to grapple with, but it's the balance, right? All that I am. So there's always two sides to it, and that's good. That's beautiful. That's okay. Your perspective is they will love me for all that I am when I am 100% authentically me. 100% authentically you. And when should you show them the 100% authentic you? All the time, immediately. To everyone, no excuses. You don't like me for me. Excuse my language, but fuck off. I deliberately say it that way because you should be incensed. It's like, it's okay not to like me, but don't think I'm going to change for you. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't grow as humans. I'm not talking about continuous improvement, and I think we should all be in the mindset of continuous improvement. But what I am saying is I will not submit my will to yours for your approval. Very, very different. Your perspective needs to be that you're worth it and that you always will be. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Your value will never increase. The value you are today is your value. And you have a look at that, particularly if you're in a really low place, and you look at that and go, that's terrifying. I really want more worth. And it's like, no, you just need to see you for who you are. You are already valuable. You're already incredibly valuable. If this can of mineral water here was a gold nugget, its value doesn't change just because I manipulate it, coerce it, abuse it, beat it, throw it around the room, throw mud on it. Its value doesn't change. And you may have had all that happen to you, but you are still that beautiful gold nugget. You're still valuable, incredibly valuable. You just need to see it. And the more you do the work on you, the more you will see it, the more you will bring that into your world, the more the world around you will change. And that I can promise you. I say practice gratitude. I say practice gratitude because gratitude is your best friend. It does a whole host of things. One, it's neurologically impossible to be anxious and grateful at the same time. You cannot do it. 
neurologically, your body releases different hormones when you're in a state of stress and when you're in a state of gratitude. Gratitude releases dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin, and it breaks down cortisol levels. It is a proven fact that the practice of gratitude over an extended period of time increases happiness on every single aspect of your life. Here's another kicker. It helps you see perspective different, which helps you alter old belief systems. So when you go through my Phoenix program, or if you join my Phoenix membership, you will see the activities that we do and how that creates shift. Because if I said to you, you know, tell me something bad that happened to you and you go, this happened, right? And I go, how'd that make you feel? And you give me a list of 10 things that are shit. And I go, okay, now tell me what you're grateful for because of it. Now you might look at it, abuse me and tell me that you don't know what I'm talking about. You might look at it and come up with zero answers. Well, I can promise you this, those zero answers are a lot better than the 10 bad things you were just going to think about. But when you learn the skill, and you start coming up with even one thing that you're grateful for, and your body starts releasing dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins, and serotonin, because you've attached that thought of gratitude to an emotion, which is gratitude, you feel differently. You feel better. And this is the shift. So we've got to learn to manage our boundaries. And it is so important and so critical it's to love yourself, trust yourself, respect yourself, and speak your truth with peaceful confidence. That is the process. That is the way that we will get out of this. Now, of course, obviously, I don't want to leave you just there. Um, that is the narcissism program, and I hope that... Am I in twice? There's me. Hey, I want to know who... I don't know how I'm in. Oh, no, it's Trish. Oh, you're in twice. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you for that. I'm, I'm <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hope that gives you a lot more insight into some into narcissism, into what you're grappling, into what you're dealing with. I think I, I hope it also gives you, um, empowers you um, to recognize, you know, the worth within you and to start orientating what you've gone through. Um, of course, I've got solutions to help drive your life forward if you feel stuck from it. Um, you can, Trish will send you some information. I'm, I'm not going to use this as a sales platform, um, but if you want to join my membership or my Phoenix program, um, the one-on-one -on -one version, you're welcome to do that. Um, so we do have solutions, but I really hope that program gives you a greater insight. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. How do I subscribe? Um, Trish will send you a link to subscribe to the membership. Um, in the membership, just so you know, the membership, um, you are so welcome, Rachel. The membership um, allows you to join into um, two sessions every single week, two group sessions every single week, where we run through a whole host of different top topics. One, you get access to the Phoenix program, and one of the sessions is dedicated to going through the program. The second session is dedicated to life, right? Whatever you're grappling with. It's a Q&A where we all join in, we talk about a subject, and we start digging into it. So it can be a whole host of different things. If there's nothing that's brought to it, I run through some of the conversations of the week. Um, that I've been dealing with, um, with with things that I think um, that it works. Uh, do I have time zones for Europeans? 100%. We constantly mix the times up. So we're covering, at the moment, we've got people from 31 countries that are coming in. So yes, absolutely. Um, and all it takes is for, um, once you're in the membership, to start going through a few things um, and if you have preferred times, we take that into consideration and we start bringing that into the mix. Um, we are in contemplation to actually increase the number of session times in the membership because we're focusing more on more of the membership because we're just getting such, I didn't think we were going to have such incredible success with a group membership um, for the people. Not, not, I knew people would join. I, did, I just wasn't sure it was going to be as powerful tool as it is based on the nature of what we're dealing with. Um, but 
it, it's just been incredible. And the people that thought they would never do a group setting are absolutely loving it. So it's really powerful. Now, before I go, um, are there any questions? Well, that could be one of two things. Well, actually, so much. <laughs> Sorry, Sylvia. So many questions. Um, I said I have so many questions, but I'm going to yeah. join the membership, I guess. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Perfect. Will you join the membership? We can ask all those questions. But is, is, is there anything you want me to tackle right now? Well, I just um, um, broke up on Monday with my narcissist, and now I'm feeling fucking afraid and yes. very tense. And I was very strong, but uh, I'm getting weak. So what yep. can I do to protect myself? Yeah, to sure. Not call again, so when, run when you, again. When you say you're feeling um, weak, can you just explain that to me? Are you feeling like you're tempted to go back or are you just feeling like you're breaking down? Um, I'm feeling... Um, pain and yep. I think to release the pain like in an addiction I want to call so that uh, I can just uh, um, yeah don't have to feel yep. the pain I guess yeah for sure for sure so what we need to understand is when you when you look through this narcissism program um, you will recognize that that's the addiction right? That's the addiction. That's the grooming. Yeah. They've groomed you when you are in pain to seek relief from them. So what does an yeah. alcoholic do when he needs to relieve that pain? Have another drink, right? What does a drug yeah. addict do? They need to have that. What? I just need one more hit. Now, Let's just look at this academically, then we'll go emotionally. Academically, you have a look at that and you go to the alcoholic, to the drug addict, to the smoker, right? To the, the food addict, to the sex addict. You know, is that one hit going to be the solution or is it going to be the problem extended? Extended, of course. Yeah, it's always going to be. It's the deference of pain. So what we have to look at with a breakup, we have to look at it with a breakup and go, okay, there's components of a breakup. And one of them is to recognize that you're not weak because you're suffering in a breakup, right? Okay. What it means yeah. is that you're feeling Thank pain. You. I'm hurting, right? I'm scared. I feel vulnerable. I feel confused. I feel lost. I feel discarded. I feel all of these things and that that is okay and it's beautiful and that it's part of the process. And it sucks. I don't mean beautiful. It doesn't suck. It's just part of recovery. <laughs> and it's one of those things where you go, you know, here's what I look at. First thing you have to do is day one. And you focus on day one. In other words, I have to leave and I have to get through day one. Then you need to get through day two. That's all you have to worry about. From day two, mm -hmm. we get to day four. From day four, aim for day seven. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what day are you in now? Um, Monday. It was on Monday. So no, no, Monday, no, no, no. How, how many days? Thursday. No contact. So four. Right. So once we get to day four, we get to day seven. Seven, we get to 14. So aim for the small periods. So day 14, you then aim for day 28, and you will have broken the cycle. Day 28. You aim for day 45, day 45, you aim you aim for day 90. Now, I know you won't probably remember all of that, um, but I'm sure, um, you know, when, when, when we talk next, we can run through this again. But look at small goals that just keep growing and recognize that this is just part of the process. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, what have you got to do? Emotionally, you've got to focus on you. Emotionally mm. got to focus on you because what's happened, a narcissist will have you focused on them and what you're losing mm. and what you're missing. So what you have to do mm. is start empowering you. And what we do, it, 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 as soon as you join the membership, start working through 
um, and download, mm. start watching the videos of my Phoenix program. It's all part of the membership. It's no extra, right? And that will be your okay. focal point on you. And make that your short-term goal. Make your short-term goal, right? Because it's what we're doing. It's not here because you're broken. It's here because you're growing, right? This is just yeah. a growth opportunity in life, right. right? And it's the type of thing where you go, no, this is my Thank growth you. opportunity and I'm going to get into relationship with me. I'm going to learn who I am. I'm going to learn the character that resides within me. I'm going to see what makes me attached to things. I'm going to learn how to set, man manage and maintain my boundaries, right? I'm going to learn to detach mm -hmm. from my traumas. I'm going to learn how to drive my life forward. All of that's in the program and you get access to it immediately. You don't have to wait for a first session with me. You get access to it immediately. And I will okay. be going through those videos, doing the activities and focusing on that. And it will start creating shift in you. You are awesome. Stay strong. <laughs> And 100%, we will always finish with a stay strong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You are so welcome. Well, I hope that was valuable to everyone. Um, um, if you have any further things, you can email us. Um, if not, I wish you all the best or I'll see you in the membership.